Uh, okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today, I will briefly talk about the mode schedule and potential food of spoon built sandpiper and Norman's green shank on the southern Jiangsu coast of China. Uh, my name is Ziyu, and I work for spoon built sandpiper in China. And for those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit organization that is based in Shanghai and we are dedicated to protect uh, the Yellow Sea shorebirds and their habitats. And actually everything started in 2008. Back then, a few members of spoonbill sandpepper in China become the first people to find spoonbill sandpepers and Northman's green shanks on the Jiangsu coast of China. And that drew great interest from scientists along the flyway and around the globe. In order to continue monitoring these two species, uh, we started conducting surveys since 2008. And after years of surveys and after constant email communications with scientists along the flyway, we came to understand that uh, spoon-built sandpipers and Nordman's green shanks come to the Jiangsu coast every spring and every autumn to rest and refuel for the next leg of their migration. In 2014, during our survey, we found over 200 spoonbill sandpipers on the Jiangsu coast. That's approximately 50% of the estimated global population of the species. And we also found over 100% of the estimated population of Nordman's green shanks back then. So that brings a question. Why do so many of them stay on the Jiangsu coast? What's so special about it? We noticed that some spoonbill sandpipers were molting their primary flight, flight feathers in autumn. Uh, we know that uh, the molting of primary flight, flight feathers is a very important life, life event for every bird. It usually takes weeks, if not four months. So we were guessing perhaps the two species were molting their feathers in the autumn. So in order to answer those questions, we conducted a study back in 2015. And uh, this is where our, uh, where Jiangsu is located. And if we zoom it in, this is what it looks like. It's located north of Shanghai. And this uh, goat bees uh, is the tidal flats along the Yellow Sea. And we chose to do the study at three sites along the Jiangsu coast, namely Tiaozini, Xiaoyangkou, and Dongling, because these were where most spoonbill sandpipers and Nordman's green shanks were found. So there were three main parts to our study. So the first part, is to estimate the transiting dates of the two species. So basically during uh, the high tide, we conducted 21 runs. Um, uh, actually it's from uh, July to November in 2015, we conducted 21 rounds of surveys and um, we recorded the number of spoonbill sandpipers and Nordman's green shanks. And then we ran Thompson's model on those data, which would give us the average arrival date of the species and average departure dates, as well as the average stopover duration of the species on the Jiangsu coast. And then the second part, and the most important part of our study is to uh, make a quantitative measure of the two species mode progress. To do that, we used a scoring scheme to score the primary feathers of the two species. Um, so, for example, we would score an old primary feather as zero, and we would score a completely new, fully grown feather as five. And this would be an example. This is the mode score of this particular individual here. So, how do we obtain the mode score? We did not go out in, into the field and catch the birds and then examine them in our hands. No, what we did was to take photos and videos of the birds stretching their wings, landing or taking off. And then we could look at the photos and 
uh, and score their primary feather. And after that, we used a model, a model in uh, our studio uh, that's called MOTE. And that mod model would give us the uh, MOTE duration as well as the MOTE starch and uh, MOTE starch days of the two species. And next is the third part of our study. Uh, because we know that not only migration, the molting of primary feathers is also a very energetically costly process that requires very abundant food resources. Therefore, we also uh, took a look at the potential food items of the two species. We know that the spoonbill sandpipers, they are, we could say they are a flagship species. They are really cute. So they easily attract attention from photographers and bird watchers. So we, uh, every now and then during the peak migration season, we would receive photos like this from photographer. They love spoonbill sandpipers. And if we are lucky, we might be able to identify the prey items just by looking at those photos. That's great. However, a potential problem with this is that we tend to overlook some small food items that are invisible to human eyes. For example, can you tell what this spoonbill sandpiper is eating in here? I guess nobody except for the spoonbill sandpiper and its prey itself. And therefore, to overcome this problem, we collected some basic core samples. Uh, basically, during the low tide, we uh, followed, we randomly followed a spoonbill sandpiper or Nordman's green shank on the mud flat, and then we took videos of them foraging for five minutes. And then we would uh, take basic core samples near where we saw them foraging. And after that, we would take the uh, basic core samples to our laboratory, and then we would identify any basic organism that's in the core samples, and we would measure their density. Uh, this is just a map showing the uh, lo foraging locations of the two species on our project site, uh, where the red dots are the foraging locations of spoonbill sandpaper, and the yellow dots are the foraging locations for Nordman's green shanks. Uh, next, I'll very briefly go through the results. So for spoonbill sandpaper, uh, on average, they started arriving on the Jiangsu coast uh, in mid-August, and then they would stay here all the way until the end of October. In contrast, Nordman's green shank would arrive on the Jiangsu coast uh, by the end of July, and then they would stay till on average the 23rd of October. And for part two, the most durations of spoonbill sandpipers and Nordman's green shanks are about 73 days and 65 days respectively. And if you compare this with the uh, transiting pace, which I just showed you in the earlier slide, you will see that their mode durations and their stopover durations on the Jiangsu coast overlap quite a bit. Uh, these two figures here show the mode progress of the two species. Here we have date on the uh, x-axis. And uh, if you look at the solid points here, and it corresponds to this axis, is the percentage of primary feather mass grown. As you can see, as we move towards the end of the survey, which is the, the end of October and beginning of November, the majority of the individuals have attained full primary feather mass, meaning that most of them have uh, their primary feathers are fully grown, and meaning that they have completed their primary mode. And now, if we direct our attention to the empty points, and they correspond to this axis, which is the percentage of individuals in active primary mode. So every point here uh, represents all the individuals whose mode scores were obtained on a single survey day. Well, as you can see, in the beginning of August, um, many, the majority of the individuals were in active primary mode. And as we move forward till the end of October, the number of individuals in active primary mode have decreased, meaning that many of them have finished their primary mode. 
And the third part, uh, our results for the potential food is quite preliminary because it only shows association, but still we have some interesting findings we would like to share. We used a correspondence analysis to analyze the two species food uh, preference. For spoon built sandpiper, we found that their foraging locations are very strongly associated with amphipods, which is a group of crustaceans that are fairly small in size and generally have laterally compressed bodies. And we found that uh, uh, the density of amphipods is the highest at Tao Zuni, uh, which is uh, now the recognized most important staging site for uh, spoonbill sandpepper. Um, however, the trend for uh, Nordman's green shank is not so clear, but our video footage did show that they mostly feed on crabs. And uh, finally, uh, some conservation implications of our study. And of course, our study built upon previous studies to show that the southern Jiangsu coast is critically important for the spoon-built sandpipers and Nordman's green shanks, because both species spent more than two months on the Jiangsu coast in autumn to complete their primary feather mode. And during our surveys, well, because you know we spoonbill sandpipers and Norman's green shanks are not that easy to see. So we also took notice of any other shorebirds uh, which might be molting their primary feathers. And we and we noticed that species such as barter gutweed, Eurasian curlews, greater great knots, and greater sand plovers were also molting their primary feathers. Some of these spe species were only thought to start molting their primary feathers after they have reached their wintering ground. And I'm sure you have heard about this great news over and over again in the past two days. That is, the most important staging site, Tiaozuni, uh, has become part of a natural world heritage site, um, which means they would get the highest level of protection. Um, however, our evidence results from our study suggest that our other, other project sites, such as Rudong and Zhongling, are also very important. For example, uh, just a few weeks ago, we were doing scan sampling surveys of spoonbill sandpipers, and we discovered that some individuals, they don't just stay pooped. They, they could be moving around, moving between these different project sites on a weekly basis. And therefore, based on our results, we recommend that the surrounding sites such as Rudong, uh, such as Xiaoyangkou and Dongling are also included in uh, the phase two of the natural world heritage application and get all the conservation attention that they deserve. And uh, I think our study showed that when we are evaluating the importance of an habitat or of an area to a shorebird, there's more than, uh, we can do more than just counting the bird's numbers because moat is another very important life event for every bird and it's an often neglected indicator. And because knowing the timing of mode can also help us um, make more effective conservation actions. And thank you very much. This is, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you.